Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hello, thank you so much for coming. My name is Amy Draves, and I'm so pleased to welcome Tara Van Vlack to the Tara Wheeler Van Vlack to the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. She's here to discuss her new book, Women in Tech, which discusses the framework that many women find themselves in joining the field, as well as success stories from professionals who have made it. Tara is the co-founder and CEO of Fizzmint. And she's also founded a web development company called Red Queen Technologies and started an initiative to add diversity to the InfoSec conference speakers. She also founded the Hack the People Foundation, which is a nonprofit mentorship program focused on underprivileged people in technology. This is her debut book. Please join me in giving her a very warm welcome. Thank you so very much. It's a real pleasure to be here today. Uh, I don't know about you people, but I am stupid tired of talking about diversity and technology. Raise your hands. Right. <laughs> I'm a little tired of it. I imagine probably you are too, and yet we keep having to talk about it. I, uh, I think that most of the reason why we find the topic fascinating and yet kind of dangerous is the amount of fear that's around it the fear that we'll say something wrong, do something wrong. So one of the things that I want to promise to you right now, and I hope that everybody in this room will join me in it, is that you can ask me any question that you want to. If you're trying hard not to be an asshole, you're probably going to succeed. It's OK to be clueless. And I will never, ever, ever punish anybody for a clueless question. You'll know the difference when you hear it, right? So if you want to ask me a question and it's a little clueless, go right on ahead. There will be no penalty for it ever. What I'm going to do is talk for a couple of minutes here, and then I would always, always love it if you would raise your hands and ask questions. If you'll ask me anything that you want to know. We'll talk mostly about the subject material I brought for you here today for the first like 15, 20, and then open this on up to conversation a little bit more. Please stop me if you don't understand anything or you want to know something. Um, I actually used to, uh, to work here, by the way. I used to work at Microsoft. I was on the Halo team for a while. In fact, my former boss is sitting in the uh, audience right now. <laughs> it's a lot of fun to get to work on things that we love, to, to play games, to have this joy in creation, in technology, in gaming. I'm a nerd, right? In, in every single direction, kind of pathetically so. I, uh, I step on more D4s than Legos, probably, I think. So how many of you in here have been part of role-playing games? OK, video games, keep them up, OK? All right. How about any other kind of nerd activity? Chess club in high school? Raise them up. That's right. That's what I'm talking about. So we're part of this conversation not just because we want it to, to create greater voices in technology, but also because we all seem to love the same stuff, right? That's why we're here. So why do we keep having to have this conversation? I think a lot of it has to do with compassion, with real compassion. And being willing to hear the things that other people have to say without necessarily immediately jumping in to tell them why you're not a bad person and why they're wrong. So the main thing I want to encourage all of us to do here is just listen to what other people have to say. I have been in startups and technology for an awful long time. And I've seen really that it's a matter of unconscious bias and unconscious assumptions that often keeps women and people of color out of technology. I don't want to leave in this conversation questions of people of color or genderqueer people out of this conversation. This is not just a binary issue. It's not men and women. It's what we expect to see in technology and the people that are actually trying to get into the field, right? I don't think it's uncommon for us to see people who talk right now, and there's, there's been a, a, a Tumblr thread running around over just the last couple of days who conflate issues of technology and kind of what I call nerdlandia, right? Because we're all part of this big conversation where we've felt from the beginning as if we are outsiders in a lot of ways, right? Technology, nerds, mathing, gaming, whatever it was we were doing. 30 or 40 years ago, it might have been the AV club and drama, right? Now it's computers and chess and RPGs. Um, this coming in a, in a couple of weeks, um, I'll be actually running 
what I am beginning to think of as a super awesome one-shot D&D campaign at the Tribeca Film Festival for DEF CON. And I get to, to play an amazing game with amazing people and, and create a wonderful challenge. And I think of that as being very much part of technology. I think there's a big connection between the two. So this is why I bring this passion to it. And I can tell you now why this book came about, if you'd like to know. I'm also kind of a crowdfunding nerd. I've done several different crowdfunding campaigns. I did a campaign in 2012 called Lady Coders to do videos to help women get into tech jobs. And what I found was that crowdfunding is a really great way to give yourself about a thousand bosses for a year and a half. <laughs> and that's seemingly what ended up happening again this time with this book. It's a really great way to find out if there is a, if there's interest in a topic. And it turned out, oh boy, there really, really is. I've done a lot of crowdfunding and the experience that I had with this one was pretty unique. How many of you have considered writing your own, no, first, how many of you have written your own books before in some fashion and gotten them published, okay? How many of you are considering or are currently writing some kind of book right now, okay? How many of you plan on writing a book sometime in the next five years on a, some kind of topic that you, okay, good. So a substantial chunk, even half of you are planning on entering publishing. Uh, I wanna very much talk about what it's like to write a book like this on a sensitive topic and get a lot of people interested in it. I could keep the, I'm gonna keep the stories of what it's like to project manage eight famous women to a bare minimum, mostly because I'm afraid of most of them. <laughs> and yet, what I do want every one of you to know is that crowdfunding is a really great option to create something like this. It gives you the chance to find out in advance if people are gonna be interested in the topic. So one of the things I'd like to do right now is ask the people in this room. I, I never know when I'm walking into a room like this whether or not the people that I'm talking to are gonna be more interested in the process of creating the book, um, in what it's like to make something like this happen, or if you're more interested in the topic that we're here to discuss in terms of diversity and technology. Which one of these two things are you more interested in? Because I've heard both, I've heard both sides come at me and ask questions. Are you more interested in learning how to make a book on a sensitive topic like this or about the topic itself and some of the topics in the book? Throw them out, ask, actually tell me what you think. Just shout it out. Topic. The topics, you do want to know the topics. Okay, for those of you that are interested in the process, the crowdfunding, what it's like to actually create like this and go find a publisher, please let me know, just follow me on Twitter and then talk to me there. That'll be the fastest way to do it. Okay, the topics in the book. The biggest one that people seem to talk with me about in this book, and I was very careful in how I worded this in the book given where I live in Seattle, but the biggest one seems to be salary negotiation for women. Um, I'm aware of some of the recent controversy uh, around that topic in this area, like right in this area. <laughs> like right about, I don't know, maybe a mile and a half that way to a mile and a half that way and take a big circle, <laughs> right about here. And what I have found is that when you mean well, you've got a place to start. And everybody involved in this conversation means well, right? There's no one here that's saying out loud, I think it's a great idea to pay women 81 cents on the dollar, right? That's killer. They're clearly worth less. So we're starting from a place of wanting to fix the problem. Everyone is. And one of the biggest things that I've seen, and this is gonna kind of blow your minds, the biggest fix that I've seen people in terms of salary negotiation, if we're gonna talk about that topic first, uh, make the biggest change is this. Advertise salary as negotiable in every job that you post. How many of you in here are hiring managers of some kind or another, or have some responsibility for hiring or writing up posts? In those posts, write salary negotiable. The reason why is women will adjust their behavior, but men will not adjust theirs. And this is, there's, there's a lot of studies to show this. Women will begin to say, okay, if salary is negotiable, then I can negotiate. Men, we're going to negotiate anyway, okay? That's the biggest change that you as a manager can make. Now, you as someone who is negotiating need to know two things. First and foremost, do not, do not name a number first. Don't name a number first. What is rule number one? Don't name a number, Don't name a number first. first. Rule number two is never say yes to the first offer. <clears throat> ever say yes to the first offer. The first offer is 10 to 15% below where they think you're going to end up. What does that number sound a little bit like? The gender gap in pay? There's a reason for that, because that's where most of the gender gap in pay comes from, is that moment right there. I call that minute zero in the gender pay gap. If you have 
a salary that you are negotiating over, assume that they came at you with 10 to 15% lower than the amount that they think that you're going to end up at. Make sense? For how many of you is this an absolutely terrifying thought? To say no? Look, I know what real estate prices are like in this area. I've been here since 2009. His ass hired me. <laughs> <laughs> right? I, I know what it's like to be here and to be afraid for your bills. I know what it's like to do this. And as somebody who teaches people about technical interviews, I constantly interview for things. You will find that almost everybody at a certain level in technology on is always interviewing. Even if that interview just looks like a cup of coffee, even if it just looks like a dinner with a friend in San Francisco, you're always interviewing for something. I know what it's like to do this constantly and I know why it's so frightening. It's because you are giving someone else the opportunity to reject you after they've said they accept you, right? Yeah. Why would you give somebody that opportunity? What's, what, is, what are some of the feelings that you have in that moment? I would love to know. If you want to raise a hand or two and tell me, those of you who have been in this situation, who've had an offer, especially those who've had someone come back and say, why didn't you negotiate later? What was your feeling in that moment? Yeah. Do, do I deserve more? Do you do? Oh, that's a great question. That's not even about the money itself, about who you are as a person. Why did you make it about who you are as a person? It's hard not to. Why is it hard not to? Can you re repeat the question for the people online? Oh, absolutely. The question is because you're worried about whether or not you deserve more. <clears throat> do you really deserve that much money? OK. It's a great question. Do you? I, I hope so. <laughs> that's not the answer to that question. Yeah. Do you? Oh, yes. What do you deserve? That, I don't. <laughs> Equal pay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's it. That's just the answer to the question. Yeah. And it's okay to say that. Um, one of the things that I found that works very, very well is to know in advance what the expected salary for that job is. And how do you find that out? Go talk to somebody who has that job and find out. Glassdoor.com. Glassdoor.com. Salary.com. These are some really great places to go find this information out. And yet, they don't necessarily tell you the whole story, right? They don't necessarily tell you if they've got a range from between $140,000 to $180,000 on, say, a senior technical program manager position, whether or not you should be being paid $140,000 or $180,000. How do you know? And at that range, you should be negotiating for that position, right? It is in bigger companies, especially at Microsoft, I understand the rate system at Microsoft, it's, um, you, you have almost a, a place that you are locked into and then a thin band where you're negotiating in there, right? Most of you have had this process happen before? Okay. I've seen that happen before and what usually ends up happening at that moment is the way you negotiate is on what I would call nonlinear benefits. Things like whether or not you can telecommute part of the time. How much funding you would get for something like parking, transportation. There's ways around a lot of salary caps at that point. So you ask questions like, are you going to pay for my gym membership instead of childcare, which I don't need? Um, hang on one second and go ahead. You were first. Uh, yeah, so it might make you feel better, but doesn't it perpetuate the salary gap? Yeah. The salary, what, what makes you feel better? If we negotiate instead of the actual salary, we mm -hmm. negotiate work uh, a day from home or yes. Childcare. I'm assuming that, there is a, that there's a band and a cap for, the, for something like that. In most companies, that's not the case. But I'm focusing what I know on what I know of the culture here and the pay rates here, which is that there's a band and a cap, right? So you can't negotiate ab above and below that cap. There's no way to do that, right? They're going to assign that based on your years of experience, the things that you've done, the degrees that you have, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. And then your question? Um, my question is similar. Uh, uh, in some positions that I have seen, um, uh -huh. instead of letting you negotiate the salary, they, they, you can negotiate the signing bonus. Mm -hmm. Does that help? Or yes, does it, it does. Signing bonus is something that often has no cap and no band on it. Signing bonus is an excellent place to make up for some of that difference. Please do negotiate hard over that. The takeaway point on salary negotiations is this. By the time it, it may appear to you, as if there are thousands of people vying for this job and at any one moment, one of those swooping, hovering vultures is going to swoop in and grab the job right out from under you, right? There are thousands of people we know about the, work sh the, the, the shortage of great jobs for people in technology, right? So it seems like at any moment, they're just gonna be like, meh, we're gonna go with person number two, you know? You're 100%, but you know, they're 99.9 .9 and they're less trouble than you, right? Is that what we're afraid of? Exactly, it's not true. The truth is, and I 
know this in almost every major technical company in the area, as well as especially small companies in the area. The truth is, is that that job interview, that opportunity never went out to the public for most really great positions. Instead, what happened was an internal email was circulated and you found out about the job probably. You probably, most of you, didn't actually just straight apply through the Microsoft site and get hired, right? Someone called you or a vendor agency brought you in or you had an interview with a friend or someone recommended you for a position or someone stuck your resume on top of a pile. How many of the people in this room had zero contact with any person at Microsoft before they applied through the Microsoft site with just their resume and then got the job. Raise your hand if that happened to you. That's what I thought, right? That means that by the time you've gotten to that job, there were really maybe only five to 10 candidates for it. And by the time they've gotten you through the process, that means that they don't have anybody else waiting. You're the best one out of all of that. And they're gonna have to go through another month of backbreaking recruiting and a lot of trouble trying to find somebody else to put in this position instead of you. You have so much more power in that moment than you think you do that it is ridiculous. Yes? Sorry, I don't want to change your momentum. However, at the same time, a lot of this is focused on if you're trying to get a job here. Mm -hmm. What about the people who already have a job here? What next? Because it seems to be that it's the, same the phrases thing. you get, yeah. you know, as you move from role to role or mm -hmm. year to year, you don't really have a chance to really ask for more, right? Once mm -hmm. your review is done and your wave is locked in, mm -hmm. you can't go back and say, well, I want more money. This is the money you got. So how does what you're saying play a part in when you've been here a while? People are already here. Okay. I'm thinking of interviewing for internal candidates the same way that I'm thinking of, in of interviewing for external candidates. So thank you for letting me know that there is a difference between the two. But even for internal candidates transitioning to another position, there's still the perception that, there is, that there's competition for that position, right? Is there ever a perception that, you, that there's no competition for a job and you have been selected for it and you will now move into it? Probably not. At least there's at least a couple of candidates for any open role, even if they're all internal, right? Right. The same logic, the same negotiating strategy still applies. They still want you in that position. So when you say it feels like there's no bandwidth to negotiate in that moment, like you already have the salary set and the cap set, why not add a starting bonus in? It's a different role. That's the moment, the only moment that you will have to change your salary. You don't have it when you're in your role, right? In technology, it's very rare, although I know Microsoft does do promotions and does do increases in salary year by year, it's very rare to substantially change your salary without changing jobs in technology. That is the only moment you're going to have to make changes in what you're doing. And, and while it has been a while since I was working at Microsoft, I know enough to know that that moment is one of the few that you will have to, to substantially change your compensation, right? Yeah, that's the only place you, that, where you can change benefits, salary, the way that you are being seen. I've only seen one other tactic work to drastically, substantially change your salary, your position, the way you are viewed by a company, and that is some kind of major educational milestone, like a degree, right? Or a major postgraduate certificate. That's the only thing that I've ever seen anyone be able to go to a lead or a manager and say, I have substantially changed my value to the company. Look, I have more letters behind my name. That's the only silver bullet I've ever seen other than changing a role that could substantially change your compensation at a company in the grade that you're in. Yes. What about industry recognition? That is less likely. And the reason why is industry recognition, if you were to, to receive some kind of an award of some kind and you're going to go and negotiate for a salary increase based on you know, you just won independent game, de game developers awards or something along those lines. Or you've just received a citation for excellence for a AAA game or a product, right? It's almost more likely that you'll be seen as negotiating for salary there as a preliminary to leaving the company, actually. I, I've seen that kind of thing happen before. So, and that is, that's anecdotal. Everything else that I've said has data and studies behind it, but that right there is just anecdotal because there's just not that many people who've received substantial industry awards such that I could give you some kind of statistical survey of it, okay? Does that make sense? It's not comfortable, but that's the only location you're gonna have to make that substantial change. Were there any other questions? Okay, so when it comes to salary negotiations, again, rule number one is do not name a number first 
Number two is never say yes to the first offer. And the third thing is you have so much more power than you thought you did in that moment that it is crazy. So let me ask you now, there's, there's some sensitive topics we can talk about, and I'm not sure what you would like me to broach, but yes. So uh, do not name a number. So mm -hmm. if they ask what is your expectation, what's the right answer to that question? Um, what you'll do is that you'll come back in that moment when, when they say, what is your expectation? You come back to them and you say, the information that you give me when you tell me what you expect of me by giving me a number first tells me how you'll value me at this company. Those, that's the phrase you use. Those are the words you use. When they say, and, and remember sometimes that you are speaking to somebody who has no real power in the situation, probably a recruiter sometimes, who's, who's getting a range on your salary just to make sure that no one's time is being wasted. And what will happen then is they'll say, I'm sorry, we, I have to have you name a number first. And you say, okay, let me know when you have a number and then I'll be happy to continue the conversation. Yeah, that's what happens when you've got somebody who maybe is just trying to get a, a, a number from you, any number whatsoever, but the second that you have named, named a number first, you have lost. You are either going to name a number that is, there's no way ever for you to magically hit on the correct number because you will either name a number that people there think is too high or too low. If too low, you're making 81 cents on the dollar. If too high, you're not gonna get the job or you're being perceived as asking for too much. And what are we all afraid of being called when we go into interviews like that, entitled? A bitch, right? Now, I have clearly, based on my wardrobe choices, chosen to go on the bitch route. <laughs> and that's okay for me. I'm, I'm comfortable and happy with having some people not like me. That's all right. There are gonna be some people that are just never gonna like me. And I had to be okay with that. I mean, I'm, I might be a little too okay with that, but sorry. yeah, you had a question? Can you ask them for the range? Just say, for this job position, what's mm -hmm. the range? Tell me the range, and then I'll give you my number. And then you go for the high end of the range. I mean, not the very high end, but you know. Always go for the high end of the range. But uh, don't, um, don't phrase it as, tell me your range. Say, the information that you give me when you tell me the range for this. Remember, it's not, it's not tell me. It's not a command to them. It's a request to them to help you. Uh, this, the thing that the women in this room are going to experience again and again is if you are too direct in this moment, you're going to flip a switch and, the, and you are going to get seen as that bitch, right? So what you do is you always, always phrase this in terms of being a team player. The information that you give me when you give me the range that you're willing to pay for this, this job tells me what I need to know about how your company values me and what I will bring to the team, okay? Always phrase it as a team player situation. Always phrase it that way. Do you understand why? When women are seen as team players, they are more highly rated, they are more highly appreciated, and they are more highly valued and promoted. You don't get the option to be the lone wolf player, right? You don't get the option to be, you know, you, we all know what titanium silos of excellence are, right? The, the days, as Mike likes to say this actually, the days when you could slide a six pack and a pizza under a door and there was a developer in there and six weeks later shipped code would come out are, are gone. Right? Yeah, we're, we're, all, we're all in source control at this point. <laughs> oh, sorry about that thing that one time, by the way. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. You will be the best place to work to a third party recruiter. Mm -hmm. but his job is, or her job, is to get people together, right? So they get paid from someone getting hired. So they can communicate the information more uh, freely. And they would kind of, you know, phrase it more politely both ways, so they would work as an intermediary. Actually, that's not necessarily always true. Um, I found that third-party recruiters are often not only friendly, but totally clueless. Um, and, it, and it does really help to push to speak to the person that you're going to actually be speaking to at that point. Yeah, it does work really well. And I've had probably about 10 experiences with vendor and recruiting agencies in the area that would tell me that when, when you have no information and that person doesn't have it, they need, to, they need to push or they need to put you in touch with the correct person. And I had another question over here. Go ahead. Yeah, what do you do if they ask you what you're current? Uh, tell them I'm sorry I'm not able to disclose that information. Mm -hmm. Because that's true. You know why it's true? Because you're not able to currently disclose that information. Yeah. Because you've decided that you're not currently able to disclose that information. <laughs> it's always true, right? You're never going to lie. You're never going to lie, ever. <clears throat> never, ever, ever lie. But that doesn't mean that you can't let them assume something that isn't necessarily true in this case, which is that you have signed some kind of document. Did you say you signed a document? You didn't sign a document, but I'm not able to reveal that information currently is absolutely accurate every single time you say it. You know why? Because you, know, you like it. 
<laughs> it's totally accurate. Another question, I think, over here someplace? All right. Do you feel like we've had the opportunity to really talk about salaries? Do you, do you have any more questions about this concept of salary negotiation? Do you want to know anything else? Some of the craziest things I've ever seen. OK, so one, one thing that's really interesting to me is it is I've never, and I want to make sure that you all know this in here, and it's the last anecdote we'll go with in terms of the salary negotiation situation. It seems like this is the most sensitive one that you all have wanted to talk about the most, so I'm happy to, to have more of a conversation with you on all this. But the thing that I want everyone in here to know is I have never even once been or heard of someone being turned down as a woman for a job when they negotiated, ever. Every single time they get more money. They don't always get that extra 10 to 15%, but they always get more money and they've never lost the job. And as far as I know, no consequences have ever come out of it. I know of one person who, after she negotiated for a position, didn't get the job and it was because the, the recruiter's sister had applied for it. Okay, you can't, you can't fight that. You, know, you can't fight that. So when nepotism is at play, that's about all you can really do in that situation. I have never even once not gotten a job. I've gotten respect. I've gotten pushback. And you know what? When I got pushback from that recruiter, I don't know if we can, we can go back and ask for more money for something like this. And I said, well, I do. How about you go back and ask for more money? And I've, I've had pushback from that person before. Um, and then I never saw them again, and I was making 15 Gs more a year. I feel super bad about that, you guys. <laughs> right? Ask yourself, what's more important in that moment? That someone that you're never going to talk to again likes you or that you make enough money to make an extra payment on your house? Right? Sometimes it's OK to not be liked. It's never OK to be dishonest. It's never OK to not be courteous. But sometimes it's OK to not have everybody like you. And for somebody that you're never going to see again and have no part of, and yet they're the one you're negotiating your salary with, bring it on. All right, I want to open it up to a few more questions. I know that, uh, yeah, go ahead. So I did have a comment from someone. We've got 100 and nearly 200 people online. And Wonderful. one person said that um, they got a rescinded offer when, they, when she tried to negotiate because they assumed they couldn't compete with Microsoft's offer. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of, there was a, com I guess, a small company that was assuming they couldn't possibly meet her mm -hmm. negotiation. Mm -hmm. You're always going to see edge cases with something along those lines. But the, the reason that that's important is, why, what was the reason they didn't give for not wanting to hire her in that moment? Not that, she was, not that she was a bad person, not that she was a bitch or she asked for too much, but that they assumed that they couldn't compete with another better offer that she was already getting, right? That's good. That's awesome. I love that. It's not great since she might have wanted to move to this other company, but in a case like that, that's not really about salary negotiation. That's about making sure that the people that you're talking to understand not just that, that they should value you, but that you value them. That's certainly a moment where you want to go to the people, if you want to move away from the position where you're making more money to less money and they know that, you want them to know that there are reasons why you're moving there. Not that anyone would clearly ever want to leave this hallowed and beautiful campus, but still, <laughs> every once in a while, you may, for some godforsaken reason, want to take a job someplace else. If that's the case and they don't think they can compete with the benefits that you've been experiencing here, make sure that they understand that it's about the culture that you want to move to, maybe an opportunity that you weren't going to have unless you went to them. But that's not about salary negotiation. It's not about being a bad person. It's about convincing that other party that they have something special that you want to be part of. And for that reason, it's okay to take a little less money. And you would be willing to do that, and that it's important to you. All right? Any other questions on salary negotiation? It actually doesn't surprise you. Yes, go ahead. So you kind of started talking about how to play well in a team. Mm -hmm. Could you kind of talk a little bit more about that part, not just about salary and you know how do I get a job and how do I come on board, but also <clears throat> how do I show up better as a team player, quote unquote, mm -hmm. as you called it? Um, what are some tips or you know observations sure. you have? Question. Yeah, the the question is how do I show up better as a team member? How do I? I'm gonna I'm gonna interpret a little bit here. Is the question how do I get credit for being a leader on the team? How do I get credit for my accomplishments without sounding like someone who's bragging? Is it, are we getting kind of close to the question? This is the flip side of what we're talking about here, and it's a really interesting question. The flip side to the salary negotiation question is when you get onto the team and you've said, well, I deserve this much to be here, is how do I continue proving on a day-to-day -day basis that I deserve to be here? 
Am I going to get credit for the projects that I'm part of? And we know that one of the major problems with women being promoted and given achievement and awards in technology is often that they're just not given the opportunities, right? They're not seen as people who are stepping up. Interestingly enough, they're often doing a lot of crazy hard work behind the scenes. I've heard a term before, which is an ugly one, but it's called office wife. How many of you have heard that term before? Yeah. Exactly. The person who always makes sure that the donuts are there, the person who always makes sure that the climate is controlled, because you're trying to make sure that the people on the team are comfortable and happy. You are serving your team, right? That is the job of somebody who's part of a team, is to be part of it, to serve that team. And yet sometimes it seems like the people that are the loudest and the least team playery are the ones that get the credit, right? It's kind of frustrating when that happens. You're caught between a rock and a hard place sometimes as a woman in this situation. And one of the most effective tactics that I have ever seen for showing people that you are authoritative, that you are there, that you're showing up and that you're showing up well, is to use a tactic I have thought of as forcefully giving the credit away to someone. I saw this happen when I saw a, a former co-founder of mine. Uh, she was sitting at a table with several different people, who, one of whom was a little bit loud and taking a lot of the credit. And one person who'd clearly done 80% of the work, it's a Pareto optimal team, right? So 20% of the team does 80% of the work, right? Well, she was the 20% of the team that had actually gotten it done. And my co-founder leaned forward onto the table and said, I just want everybody here to know that I think that Lisa did a spectacular job getting all of the areas of this project covered in time. And I think we need to give her a great deal of credit for that. She stood up to do it, stuck her fists down on the table just like this leaned forward and said, I want everyone here to acknowledge what an amazing job she just did. What did that do for my co-founder, who at that point was on that team? Not a rhetorical question. What did it do? Yes? Oh, back here, OK. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for one thing, that's a power position. Mm -hmm. uh, second, it's, it's establishing leadership. And mm -hmm. like by, by doing the recognition, you're actually showing that you have the authority to make that recommendation. Absolutely. That's exactly what that is. What she did in that moment was she expressed that she had a huge amount of power personally and that she was giving the credit away. And as a result, she got all the credit for being a strong leader in that moment by strongly giving credit to someone else. And as a result, she didn't compromise her position as a team player. Does that make sense? That is one of the most powerful moves I've seen someone make. I do, upon occasion, a little bit of coaching behind the scenes for women who are, are worried that they're not showing up really strongly. And I always offer that as an option to them. When you see that your voice is not being heard, give it strongly to someone else. Because that person's not going to take anything from you. All you've just gotten in that case is more power for you and not less for anyone else, right? The more strong and giving personalities there are in a team, the better, as long as you're willing to work together. Is there any way to fix that whole problem of someone who is usually the noisiest and the loudest on a team's talking? Um, they're not, not usually really is there, honestly. Um, you can pair those personalities away over time. Uh, sometimes they end up in manager roles. Sometimes they end up out of the company. And there's not really a lot that people have been able to do about it that I've been able to see. Other than when I'm in charge, I fire assholes. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> but setting yeah. as a team norm this uh, giving credit to others and appreciating each other out loud mm -hmm. um, can turn some of those noisy voices mm -hmm. into cheerleaders among and within mm -hmm. the team um, and talk a little bit less about themselves and a little bit more about the work mm -hmm. and each other. So mm -hmm. I've seen that transformation once. It was lovely. It's beautiful to see. There's always a suggestion, too, and this isn't just for the men in the room, and for the, uh, but for the women in the room also. When someone has the floor, when someone on a team is talking, when someone is presenting something, and they are looking for strong feedback, it's very common for a couple of members of the team to, um, to start participating in the discussion in such a way that they um, are not asking questions, but instead are 
sort of taking over the situation, if that makes sense, where they're the ones who start presenting on behalf of the other person. They want to clarify on behalf of the person doing the presentation. They want to be the one who gets the credit, and so they, they'll raise a hand and say, wait, no, here's, a, here's my opinion of what needs to be happening instead. And it always masquerades that way. Think instead before every one of us opens our mouth when someone else basically is getting the situation handled, when they're doing the presentation, when they're doing the talking, and make sure that you're not trying to steal the spotlight from anyone. Everybody gets their turn in the spotlight. Everybody always will. Um, but let questions be questions and let suggestions remain on paper so that you're not taking away from the person who's clearly worked hard on what it is that they've been doing. I've seen that happen a lot when women are in front of audiences, especially that are mixed or often um, don't have a great deal of women in them, where they'll ask for questions and instead what ends up happening sometimes is they'll get pieces of their time taken over by people who want to clarify or provide their own content. Work hard on making sure that you are the one listening in cases like that. Yeah. And if you see that happening yeah. happen to somebody else, yes. return the focus to that person. Mm -hmm. Ask them a question. Ask them what they Always. think about what the person, you know, what the person just said or, mm -hmm. you know, return the spot like that mm -hmm. to them. Exactly. And if it happens too many times, sometimes you need to take somebody aside and say, I don't know if you realize this, but you raised your hand four times and there was no question, right? You know, seven minutes out of that 60 was you, not them. So that often helps is just when you see someone doing that, most of the time they don't know that that's happening, right? They, they just haven't realized that that's been the case. So you just take someone aside and say, I don't know if you've realized that this is happening or not, but this is a different person's time right now. And so letting someone else have the credit is a strong way of asserting your own power in all of those cases and still staying a team player. Does this make sense to everybody? Wonderful. All right, so what other questions do we have right now? Yeah. Um, so we've talked a lot about you know individuals sure. advancing their career, their salary, et cetera. But what can we do to make tech a place that is more inviting to women? That is a wonderful question. The thing that I always like to say is the way that we pay women more money is pay women more money. I strongly advocate the tactics that Mark Benioff at Salesforce is taking right now where he is openly doing uh, salary analyses of all of the people on his staff and raising salaries for every woman, every person really, to a commensurate level with everyone else in their pay rate because he's finding out that women have not negotiated and men have in, those pay, in, in their salary ranges. And what he's doing is he's making it clear inside the company as well. I mean, think about what that does culturally speaking. It means that if you are one of the managers who has a team full of women who are being paid less than the men on your team, all of a sudden you're sitting there thinking to yourself, I need to pay more attention to this because my boss is noticing the fact that I am discriminating against women on my team. That is a culture of accountability right there and an impressive one, right? So you open it up and you say to yourself, what is my company doing wrong that I can fix? We should be asking ourselves that question, whether we're at the, the top of a company or we're the people that are turning the lights off at the end of the day. Always be asking yourself what you can be doing to make your team a better place. These are the people you spend more time around than the people you married. Don't you want to like them, you know? <laughs> at least as much as you hopefully like your partner, <laughs> right? You're going to spend 14 hours a day around these people. You should probably like them and respect them and treat them well, right? Because you want to be treated and liked and respected well yourself, all right? When it comes to that question of equalizing out salaries, that's a really solid one. One of the other ones that I've seen is the thing that I just brought up about making sure that when everyone else is asking questions, you are also asking a question instead of making statements or taking over the discussion. That's probably the single biggest thing that I've seen women get irritated with because there's no defense against it. There's no defense against it except for fixing it afterwards or finding some way to carefully work it into the conversation. Make sense? Yeah. The other thing that helps is making sure that when the conversation turns to this question of diversity and technology, that it is not one where only women are in the audience. Um, this is actually a pleasantly gender balanced discussion of the problem right at the moment, believe it or not. And there is no way that the proportion of women in this room, sorry, but this has got to be true, is reflective of the entire staff of Microsoft, right? I, I worked here too, right? So, uh, and yet there are more men in this audience than is usual for a discussion of diversity and technology. So I really do salute you all for being part of the, of the conversation. I really like men, right? 
Super big fan. You know, I work, I work around them all day long. I was going to go into technology. Like, if you don't like men, why would you go into tech? I mean, they're going to be 90% of the humans you talk to. So, and I, I recognize that. And so I, I play RPGs and I hang out and most of my friends are, are men. And I like them just fine. Super big fan. You know, I, I, I get along with them really well. And I don't hate or have a problem with men. I think that really the, the flaw in all of this conversation is some kind of assumption that men have like a deep conspiracy. I mean, I've had pizza with lots of dudes. There's no conspiracy happening there, <laughs> right? So there's no conspiracy happening. It's just, yeah, I love that look right there. Oh, nope, seriously, no, there's no way there's a problem. <laughs> so it, the question is just one of how do we take great intentions and transform them into wonderful actions that are positive and actually have an effect. The positive and actually have an effect portion of this is Make sure that you are paying women equally. Make sure that if you are on a team with women that you see them getting at least as much credit as the other people around them. And if you are part of the culture of technology, and when I say culture, I'm talking about the whole culture of tech. Whether or not this means that you have a, a Game of Thrones viewing party or <laughs> you have any other participation in kind of the bigger culture uh, of tech, games and the industry and space robots. And any part of it, you make sure that the voices of all of the people in that room are being heard. And I do not just mean women in this case. I also mean people who do not identify as male or female, anyone who may exist outside that traditional gender binary. I don't know about you, but I basically don't care that much what gender somebody is. I care whether or not they make good cookies. I care whether or not they care about Arrow, because that whole Felicity thing is just awesome, <laughs> right? I, I'm a nerd and I like talking to nerds. I don't worry as much about the gender until someone makes me have to care about it. And then I get resentful of that. I don't want to care, I don't want to have to care about the fact uh, of what I'm wearing before I walk into the game store when I know that 30 of the 40 people in there are going to be people that work at the same tech company I do, right? Let's not pretend that the, the larger kind of nerd and geek culture and technology and software and gaming isn't all interconnected with one another. That these conversations that we have in, in cosplay and in video gaming and in chess and in robots and in logistics and where we buy and sell our books don't all have something to do with one another. Be a good participant in this larger community because I mean, you're stuck here. You're not going to cease liking comic books, I promise you. I've tried. There's no way to give them up. I have tried. And there's, you know, sooner or later, they're just going to migrate to your, you know, your mobile device instead. I was going to say iPad, but I feel like that's a little tasteless right at the moment. <laughs> sooner or later, they're going to show up on your mobile device, but you can't give them up, right? I can't give up cosplay. I can't do it. And this is a larger community we're part of. What are some of the communities that you're part of? Nerd communities. Throw them up. Magic. Magic. Dude, you're way nerdier, yeah. This guy's are like the, that's the AV club, get out. All right, no. All right come on, give me some more. <laughs> What's that? Maker. Maker, kill, oh, I love, okay, so Glowforge, you seen the, the laser desktop cutter? Oh yeah, that's yeah. super cool. All right, what else do you guys have? What's that? Lego groups. Legos, Lego Mindstorms, oh, so cool. What else are we part of? Citizen Science Initiatives. She's cooler than everybody. Anyone else? <laughs> what else are you part of? Steampunk, sure, absolutely. All of these cultures are things that we enjoy, that we take part in, and that we bring to who we are in our work. There's a bigger problem here, I really think, than, quote, ladies in tech. The bigger problem is one of inclusiveness and community, and not feeling like because we ourselves were excluded once, I certainly was, that we now have the right to exclude others. Instead, that needs to transform into a responsibility to include others. Yes? Good. The last topic I can talk about on the book is this. The process of making this whole thing happen has been one hellacious one behind the scenes and at the same time a very rewarding one up front because it's really started to be part of the mainstream discussion. There's a lot of frustration and anger I think in the community of people working to solve this problem and sometimes it spills over into anger at well-meaning people who are just learning about the problem when you get um, people who ask questions about how to help in issues of diversity and technology and they get told to educate your damn self, right? I, I also get frustrated every once in a while when someone says to me on Twitter, tell me about why you care about the women in technology issue. I would love to know more about diversity in tech. And it's Twitter. So clearly I don't think before I post. 
Uh, and I, I might, you know, if I'm in a particularly bad mood, snap off something along the lines of, gee, if only there was a way for you to find that information out yourself, rather than expecting to take up a substantial portion of my day teaching it to you. There's a difference between the internet like that, and sometimes that can be a little more hostile climate, and thoughtfully, reasonably asking questions of the people that are around you, maybe who have different identities than you do. So here's the last portion of what I want to talk with you about today, which is how do we educate ourselves about this problem in such a way that we are not putting a burden on the people who are already experiencing the problem. Um, there's a lot of great examples from what I've done, so I'm going to give you, I, I like to think of the definition of awesomeness as being willing to learn when you have made a terrible mistake to not make it again, so I'm going to be awesome right now. <laughs> I, uh, I recently had a situation where I had someone very angry at me because I said something that um, I didn't know was inappropriate. And what happened? I, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna back a little bit off of that one instead. Give a different example of one because that one's a little too sensitive and still kind of ongoing. So instead, I'll give you an example of this one. I also sometimes teach college classes. I teach introduction to programming stuff like that, um, information technology to disadvantaged adults. And I had a student recently who was a woman of color um, sometime over the last year or so. And she was, she was a nerd, she was awkward, she was exactly like me at the time. And she was very frustrated and very angry about what she saw, at, very rightly so, as a lot of the injustices facing especially women of color in technology. And I didn't know how to help her. I didn't know if it was my job to help her. And what I did was I went and asked two spectacular women developers I know, both women of color, and said to them, I'm in a situation where I can help and mentor a young woman who is frustrated and angry, and I would love to help her succeed and, and have her know that there's a way to solve these problems without having the people around you run away from you because they're afraid of how angry you are. And I said, clearly there is no way that I'm going to sit there and tell a woman of color to be less angry, because that's dumb and it's, it buys into a stereotype, but I wanna help her succeed and help her know some of the things I needed to know about other people to get to where, my, where I'm at. And I told them both, here's my plan to do what I need to do. Will you tell me if you have the opportunity to, if I'm correct on these points, um, and let me know if there's anything that I can do better, or maybe offer me some resources that might have helped you. The difference between going to people and, and saying, educate me about the problems that you face because I feel like learning about it, about it right now. And what I did was this. I tried to come up with a solution on my own and I asked for critique, showing that I would put the time in to try to fix the problem. When you show that you're willing to put the time in to fix the problem, somebody else who cares about that problem is way more likely to help you, all right? D does it make sense why I would approach that problem in that way? The reason I did that this time is because previously I screwed it up. I have screwed that problem up before. I've gone to someone and said, I don't know how to help this person. What's all the stuff you do? Educate me about your world. And they're like, I don't have time for that. So instead, this time I went and Googled. And I found resources in the area and something that I could offer this young woman to help her. And I asked for critique on my own efforts instead of someone else's day. That's the best solution that I can offer you for if you yourself want to learn about a problem, a very serious problem right now, is the issue of the transgender community in technology how they're being treated, how people who are transgender in tech do not have the same opportunities and face profound discrimination at every level in technology, in gaming, in the, the, the larger culture, okay? And I'm not always perfect as an ally there, but I'm trying and I'm learning and I screw up all the time. Be willing to accept that people who have been discriminated against their entire life sometimes can't always be perfect either. Just because you're right doesn't necessarily make you perfect. All right? I do my best to be a good ally to people who have different identities than I do, and I'm grateful for the men that I know who have been wonderful allies to me. So the last piece of this is, when you have the opportunity to help someone to make the community a better place, please do so. The greatest mentorship that I've ever received, to be frank, almost all the mentorship I've ever received is from older, rich, straight, white, cis males. I'm presuming hard on the straight and the cis, I don't know for sure, glad I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but these are, these are the men who've helped me because they're the ones who've gotten to the places that I want to go to. There aren't enough women there yet to help me and teach me what I need to learn. Sometimes they're not perfect either, and they come to me and say, how can I be better? And I put my time in helping them, right? 
I want to live in a, in a technological world where I can take joy in what I create rather than experience pain of being excluded from something that I love. I've had that a lot in my life. I think we've all experienced the exclusion from something that we love. I don't like that much. I'd rather live in a world where I get to participate in anything that I want to and people joyfully welcome me into a collective instead of one where they keep me out based on what I look like. That is a stupid ass reason to keep somebody out of a, gro of a, a group of really awesome gamers, right? Or one killer open source project. I wanna get into a world where I never again have to tell my students, my female students, that they need to use a gender neutral name and avatar to get their answers on Stack Overflow. And I still have to do that. Let's get to that place first. All right. Any last questions that any of you have? Go ahead. Me? Mm -hmm. So I want to ask and it's a partial question, partial again, suggestion. You seem to equate a lot the belonging to a community of those gamers, you know, mm -hmm. having books and so on with technology. But uh, for example, if you take me, well, I read books, right? Like I'm here. But also, like, for example, cooking and, you know, cars and guns and I'm really part of this Nordic community. <laughs> Yet I'm fairly recent. You know, the technology part. And I feel that a lot of frustration may be coming that uh, being part of the new culture doesn't necessarily translate to being in technology. Right? So the people, mm -hmm. they are doing all those things, being nerdy and so on, but maybe they are not really good at actually delivering. I might not understand the question. What's the question? The question is that uh, in this equation of the you know, community and being actually being able to do the work, mm -hmm. be successful in technology, that would cause a lot of frustration because people feel that they are part of community and everything, mm -hmm. and yet maybe they're not good at the actual technical part. I'm not too worried about the people that, they're, yeah. They're part of the first one. I'm not really worried about the, I'm talking about the interlap between the culture of technology and actual technologists. So if you're a nerd and yet you don't code, this, I'm not talking to you right now. I'm talking to technologists who are part of the overarching culture. Well, yeah. I want to say that maybe yeah. there's, there's no, there might, not, there might not be, always. And there were some more questions, I think. Anybody else? I think they want me to sign a couple of books back here. I am so glad to have had the opportunity to be here in front of you today. Thank you so much for your attention. Any of you that want to talk with me further, please just let me know. Come on up and have a chat. I am really looking forward to it. Thank you so much for your kind attention today.